Hello everyone, welcome back. We'll be going through the next five questions, questions six to ten in this video. If you haven't seen the first video where we did questions one to five, um, you can take a look at it first before returning back here. Now the questions six to ten in uh, AIME are, well, first things first, not very easy. But uh, more specifically, this is the range of questions that will often determine whether you have got a so-called good result or um, okay result. Because um, as I mentioned the last time, five questions is pretty decent, but you will rarely need to take three hours to do five questions. Because if you don't know how to do it, uh, 30 minutes is unlikely to help. So you will have ample time to try these and how these five questions turn out is going to be pretty pivotal. Now, I haven't really looked at these five questions in great detail, so this is going to be sort of the first time I'll look at them more carefully and perhaps together with you. So, first up is question six. Alice knows that three red cards and three black cards will be revealed to her one at a time in random order. Before each card is revealed, Alice must guess its color if Alice plays optimally, the expected number of cards she'll guess correctly is... Okay, so find the expected number of correct answers. Now, if I'm looking at this, the optimal play is pretty boring, right? You just have no control over which card is reviewed. So you would just guess the one that has the majority remaining. So plays optimally just means guess the majority color there is nothing better that you can do and so therefore I just need to see which is the majority color because if the majority is let's say three black and one red then you have a three quarter chance of guessing correctly if you have got just let's say uh, three black and two red then your chance is three fifths instead okay so the first round with 3 and 3 it doesn't matter what you are going to do you are going to have a half chance at least you're going to have a half chance to be correct which means the expected number is half for the first guess now the last card you will be left with zero one now whether it's zero red and one black or one red and zero black uh, you are guaranteed to have the correct guess right so it's about everything in between that is going to impact the result so we're going to sort of draw a little bit of a diagram to keep track of what's going on um, the first thing is going to be that whichever is reviewed you'll be left with two three which means that at two three there will be a three-fifth chance of getting the correct one as mentioned earlier now with two three you may have 2-2 two, two, or 1-3. So we can repeat this process again. There's a half chance of being correct here, there's a three-quarter chance of being correct here, and then it will continue branching again. So 1-2 And for one tree, it may also end up going to zero tree, which means that you are guaranteed. Now from one two, you have got uh, one one, which is a half chance of being correct, or it can go to zero two, which is also going to be a guaranteed correct answer. Zero three goes to zero two, zero two goes to zero one, and then after that. Zero, 0 is the end. So we have got this little bit of a tree diagram here in a sense. Now for each of those branchings, I also just need to know what is the chance of getting to each of these. So you're guaranteed to come here, but you have a greater likelihood of going to 2-2, two, two, which is the 3 fifth chance, and the 2 fifth chance of going to 1-3. In fact, the probability we have calculated is also what's going to sit on that branch. Except for the cases where it is symmetric and so it's just half and half in a way. So I can just write down all of these probabilities 
as such. Forgot to write the arrow there. So from 1, 1 and 0 to both of them are going to come here and both of these are going to come here. Okay. Now I'm going to then just add up the expected value by looking at each layer and for each layer I just see what's the chance of success. So for example at this layer it's guaranteed to be half and this second layer is guaranteed to be three-fifths. And the final layer here, this is guaranteed to be, uh, well, guaranteed, so it's guaranteed to be one. For the other intermediate layers, I need to see what's the chance that you end up on each of the two cases. So for this layer, it's three-fifths chance of half and two-fifths chance of Three fourths. This would be equal to uh, just three over five. The next layer, the chance of ending up with two thirds is well. I think it's easier to get the chance of ending up with this one, this zero three, is two fifths times one quarter. Um, 2 fifth times 1 quarter is 1 over 10 which means that the other case you have a 9 over 10 chance of reaching there so this is 7 over 10 the next layer here um, the chance that you end up on the 1 1 is 3 fifths times 2 thirds so I think this has more cases to branch but uh, I already know that it's 9 over 10 1 over 10 of reaching here so 9 over 10 times 2 thirds would be the chance of ending up on a half 9 over 10 times 2 thirds is 3 fifths and so the other 2 fifths chance of just being 1 now this gives me 7 over 10 again. So if I add up all of these together, a very quick calculation, which I hope is not wrong, tells me that I should have 41 over 10. So the answer is 51. Let me double check. So I have a list of answers next to me just to make sure that uh, if I say anything wrong, I can just quickly rectify it. Obviously, you don't have the benefit in competition. So uh, for something like this, if let's say you did not have the benefit like me of looking at answer just uh, in the, from the corner of my eye, I would suggest that um, you check your answers pretty carefully because one wrong fraction in this very long list or one wrong number in this very long list would lead you to the wrong answer already. And it's pretty hard to tell. So this is uh, question six. Is there a faster way? I think there are many equivalently um, equivalent ways that take roughly the same amount of work, but I don't believe there is an instant way to do it. So this is probably the best we can do. All right. Next up is question seven, which is on the thumbnail. Uh, we call a positive integer distinct, well, extra distinct if the remainders where n is divided by two, three, four, five, six are distinct. Immediately, this sounds like it is quite constraining because there are not that many remainders you could have when divided by 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, right? Your remainders, I'm going to just sort of put down the list, which is 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3. This is your list of possibilities, which is not even entirely achievable just by oh now let me pick any combination right because for instance if a number is divisible by six it is also going to be divisible by two and three so i'm going to do just some like minor um like reasoning out of things like what i just said okay so i want to see what it can be so i don't see an issue with mod two but it cannot be 0 mod 4 because if a number is 0 mod 4 it is 0 mod 2 as well 
Likewise, if it is 1 mod 4, it is 1 mod 2. So these two are out. 5 is co-prime to the other, so there's not much issue. But 6 is interesting as well, because uh, 0 mod 6 would mean 0 mod 2, 1 mod 6 would mean 1 mod 2, 2 mod 6 would mean 2 mod 3. So these are also out. Uh, and so your choices are basically 3, 4, and 5, as far as I can tell. Now, are there any other um, issues to consider? I don't see anything yet. Okay, so we have done a little bit of pruning. Now, 5, I think, is the most flexible. Um, the 2, 3, 4, and 6 are all a little bit linked together. So I'm going to try to see, um, well, how they affect each other. Okay, so first thing I will try is, what if it is a 0 mod 2? Now, if it's 0 mod 2, then it must be an even number mod 4 and 6. So this will be forced. 0 mod 4 and... So 2 mod 4 and 4 mod 6. Now by elimination, that leaves only 1 mod 3, which is consistent with 4 mod 6. That is okay. And then you get 3 mod 5. So this is a bit boring as it uh, transpires. You realize that this is the sequence of things that you get. Now, this case, before we even move to the other case, I see that oh, this is nice. 0 mod 2, 1 mod 3, 2 mod 4, 3 mod 5, 4 mod 6 means that n plus 2 is congruent to 0 modulo the LCM of 2 to 6, which is 60. So n is negative 2 mod 60 would be what satisfies the 0 mod 2 case. Alright, so now I erase this off and then I will try the 1 mod 2 case to see what we get. So 1 mod 2 would give 3 mod 4 by the same reasoning. Now it must also be odd modulo 6, so it is now just forced to be 5 since 3 is already used up. Now 5 mod 6 means 2 mod 3. And then by elimination here, you have got 0 or 4 mod 5. Okay, so one of them, if it's the 4 mod 5 case, then it would just be like before, 1 mod 2, 2 mod 3, 3 mod 4, 4 mod 5, and 5 mod 6 n is negative 1 mod 60. So that's the first possibility. The second possibility is that if it's 0 mod 5, then I can still say that n plus 1 is 0 mod the rest of it, mod 12. And if I combine this, uh, n is congruent to negative 1 mod 12, means that modulo 60, which is the same thing we're looking at, you can list out negative 1 plus 12 is 11 plus 12 is 23 plus 12 is 35 and so this is the guy that we want 35 mod 60 so now that we know the possibilities are 35 negative 1 and negative 2 we are going up to a thousand so 1000 Divided by 60 is 16, remainder 40. So which means that you will fit in 16 sets of 3 cases. And the last cycle goes only from 0 to 40 mod 60. And therefore only the 35 will fit in. So the answer I believe is 49. Yes, good, it is 49. So most of these sorts of problems, you want to ask yourself, is there something that makes this less difficult than it sounds like? And so when I look at 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, the not very um, mathematical sounding thing which I would say is that, oh, these are really small, so I can list. 
But of course, list doesn't mean we'll really list. It just means that after I write down the list of possibilities, we can actually write it almost like a mini logic puzzle of sorts. Right? Which, if let's say the numbers were 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, I would not be so keen to do something like that. Okay. Next up, question A. Uh, a geometry question. It's a rhombus, which is quite nice. Uh, there's an in circle. Now, all rhombuses, rhombi, uh, all rhombuses have an in circle. So, this makes sense. And then a point on the in circle such that the distances from P to the three sides or lines uh, are 9, 5, and 16, respectively. Okay. I don't know how exactly should be the scale of this rhombus. So I'm just going to try. Um, obviously, I know where to put the acute and obtuse angles. It's something like uh, the angle A is the acute angle. But uh, I'm not sure whether what I've drawn here looks very much like two equilateral triangles glued together. So a 60 degree and 120. Maybe it's more narrow, but we will see. Uh, the in center by symmetry will be at the intersection of the diagonals, but I don't really want to draw that. So I'm just going to uh, this is the diameter. So I am going to yeah, these all look the same, right? So uh, good, my rhombus is not too poorly drawn, and I will draw a circle to the best of my limited artistic abilities. Okay, something like that. I don't know how important the, these are. Uh, we will see, but I'll just leave the center there. Now, I want to know where P is roughly. Um, P is closest to AB, somewhat close to AD, and uh, pretty far away from BC. Now, AD and BC are opposite, so actually it means that like, if let's say my P is uh, somewhere down here, then this is actually going to be a straight line, not a tangent line, just a straight line. I feel that this is reasonable for the purposes of what we're doing. So I'm going to stick with this diagram. I don't need to redraw it. 5, 9, and uh, 16. Okay, I think I can live with that. Okay, yeah, I'm just going to label this with well, something. I will call this B, and then um, all of these feet of perpendiculars, I maybe will just call them X, Y, Z because just because. Okay, so now for this one, uh, I'm supposed to find the perimeter of ABCD, which of course, this is a rhombus, so it is just telling me please find the side length. Okay. So my diagram is not perfect, but uh, I think it has quite a lot of uh, sufficient features that um, allow us to do computations. And this is the sort of thing which is quite suitable for, well, computations. Now, in order that I can do computations, uh, I am thinking of the fact that P is essentially nothing special except for the fact that it's on the in circle. Right? So the only thing that makes uh, this interesting is that it's on the in circle. And since the only thing that's interesting about it is that it's on the in circle, uh, it would likely mean there is some power of a point things to do. Now, if there's some power of a point things to do, then perhaps I might need to mark out some more um, intersections. Specifically, there is one intersection which is not marked out and I want to sort of indicate. So 
the one that is the second intersection of YZ with the circle. Uh, this is not the same as the point of tangency. So I'm going to just make sure that I know those are not the same. This is also not the same as the intersection between YZ and AB. So these are three different things. As far as I can tell, I see no reason why they should be identical. So yeah, I think I should be careful with how I label things. Uh, I can call this Q, R, and S. I don't know which ones I'm going to use, but I'll just write down a bunch of equations and then we'll see how things go. Okay, so let me see which of the points to come from. Well, I want to use something that cuts the circle at two places, which means the line YZ cuts it at two places. I want to also make sure that I don't use something on the circle. So, well, I can use Y and Z, right? That is a very reasonable pair of things to be using. So if I use Y, I get YP times YQ equals to now, it's going to be the same thing actually here. So I guess I don't know if I want to give this a name, but it is uh, pretty humble. So let's call this M and N. So from Y and from Z, I can get the same sort of result. Y M squared, this one is Z N squared. Now these two are the same thing. And if they are the same thing, YP, YQ, ZQ, and ZP, they have the same sum. So the two lengths have the same sum and the same product, which means that they must be the same pair of numbers. Right? And I know that YP is 9 and ZP is 16. So if they are the same pair of numbers, that means that this is 16, this is 9. And of course, that means that this is 144 equals to 12 squared. So good, I've got myself another length. Okay, YM and uh, ZN are both equal to 12. Okay, and uh, if I have YP is 9 and ZP is 16 and ZQ is a little 9 so it means that this PQ is equal to 7 down here. Surprising, this is not a terrible diagram. I am uh, pretty happy with what has happened. Okay, so what I haven't used yet is the 5, right? I've used 16 and 9 to some extent at least. I haven't used the 5. So I need to think about how to use 5. Now, if I want to use 5, Perhaps another thing that uh, comes to mind is that there is some sort of symmetry down here. Uh, there's some sort of symmetry where I've already got P, Y, and P, Z, and P, X. So I could consider extending it to here, to the other side. Now, I don't know if they intersect inside or outside. Uh, let's just assume maybe it intersects outside. I don't think it makes a huge difference. And uh, let's call this W and call the other intersection. So we have got a lot of points going on. Uh, let's call this point. Uh, I've got P, um, Q, R, and S. Let's call this T. So by the same reasoning as uh, we had with the previous pair, uh, I don't know what is this length specifically, but uh, it means that this 
TW should also be 5, so I'll just note that down. And I don't know what is this PT. Now, one of the ideas which I have is to consider area. So, I, that's the reason why I'm dropping this. So, let's try, right? So, if we let the side length be S, then the area of ABCD is going to be equal to, on one hand, it's going to be 16 plus 9. times the side length. On the other hand, if I use the other way, so actually I do kind of know what it is, right? It should be 15. It should be equal to xw times ab, which is the same side length. So this is equal, and that was quite silly, right? I mean, the height should be the same in every direction. So uh, I guess that doesn't in itself tell me so much. Uh, if this is 5, this is 5, then this here should be 50. But what this is doing is that it's starting to give me quite a lot of lengths that are potentially useful. Okay, um, by using your um, same reasoning again, it means that uh, I'm not going to name this, right? I have too many points. Uh, XP times XT equals to X. Where is the tangency point? I called that S, didn't I? Uh, so the XS is equal to 10. Okay, so we are getting quite a lot of headway in terms of quantities of lengths. But I need to make up my mind in terms of, so how am I actually going to find the length of the sides or find this S? So let me look around and see, I have a lot of Pythagoras that I can use. I'm just curious if let's say if I want to use Pythagoras, I don't want to do it too indiscriminately. So which um, Pythagoras do I actually want to use or do I actually not need it anymore? Now, something promising is also that I just really need any trigger thing and that would also be enough. Right, uh, because the height is 25 so if let's say I knew sine or cosine of any of the angles A, B, C, D I can be able to use that to find S so maybe I'll do some trigger thing uh, and to do some trigger thing it means that I can just focus on okay what angle does this equal um, equate to. I feel like there are lots of angles that this should be equal to uh, and I feel that I am supposed to have enough by now to be able to find that. So I see that this would be equal to something like this ZBX or ZBR but that does not seem like a length that I can actually make use of annoyingly enough because I mean or rather that does not look like lengths I know and so I don't think I have anything with which I can use it So let me take a look.
Ah, so I actually know the size of this circle as well, right? It's like um, the in circle that I've known the size for a long time that the diameter is uh, 25. That this 25 we've been calculating is the diameter of the in circle. So maybe what I can do is something like this. I doubt this is absolutely necessary, but I feel like uh, this may be the thing that comes most simply to me. So I'm going to just uh, zoom into this uh, little portion down here. So this is the angle that I want. But right now, what do I know? I know that this is Okay, which one is on the circle? This is on the circle, right? So this is 25 over 2. I actually don't know the horizontal distance. If I knew that, I mean, I would be very close to being done, right? Uh, or do I know that already? Is that... This is 12, right? This is 12. Yeah, okay, so this is 12, and this is the same as those other two things, the x s that I'm supposed to have found, right? It's just my drawing is not perfect yet. So this is x s and this should therefore be equal to that 10. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so it's a 3, 4, 5 again, right? You should have uh, figured that out by now. So uh, by Pythagoras, this is 15 over 2. This is a 7, 24, 25 triangle. So this is 7 over 2. And so sine of this angle C okay so now we are in business so the alphas are in your uh, 7, 24, 25 triangle and your cosines in the 3, 4, 5 triangle And ooh, amazingly enough, 28 plus 72 is 100. So 100 over 1 to 1, this is 4 fifth. The whole thing's a big 3, 4, 5 triangle. Okay, I'm sure there will have been other similar triangles in there. It's just there's too much going on. So once I feel that I am getting too complicated a diagram for an AIME, I usually want to go computational because I don't think I can like find the correct similar triangles when there's a lot of stuff that is clouding my view. Okay, so if the thing is a giant 3, 4, 5 triangle, it means that, let's say if this is 25, then CD is 5 over 4 times of 25. And therefore, the perimeter is 1 to 5. Great, so that was not easy because at no point in time was I sure that I was like almost done. But I was sure that what I was doing was not useless. So this is something that uh, for the AIME, um, well set questions often would be in this form where you don't know whether the thing that you're finding is going to be useful for sure. But it's worth a shot. So that took a little while, but it's okay. Remember the time control for the AIME, three hours. So if you take, let's say, half an hour for the first five questions, one hour for the next five questions, and one and a half hours for the last five questions, then that will be the pace that will allow you to finish. And uh, if you are not aiming to finish, let's say, the last five or all of the last five, then some of that one and a half hours from behind can be shoved to the front. Okay, question 9. Find the number of cubic polynomials px equals x cubed plus ax squared plus bx plus c where a, b, c are integers from negative 20 to 20 such that there is a unique integer m other than 2 where p, m equals to p of 2. That's interesting. 
Um, I. Hmm. Let's, let's go with the most literal approach first and see what happens, okay? Because I think we always want to um, not take the assumption that the question is going to be impossibly hard. So uh, if there is something that is going to be obvious and we miss it because we assume the question is hard, we will feel very annoyed with ourselves. So I'm grouping it like this because I do know that 2 is one of the roots. No matter what A and B are, C doesn't really matter, right? So whatever we have in the end, I feel like C is largely irrelevant. I feel like it's going to come back and haunt me later. Uh, but I think it's, it should be irrelevant. I don't see why it should matter. So C should be largely irrelevant. Uh, if I divide off by m minus 2, there is a unique integer m not equals to 2 such that pm equals to p2 so i want there to be a unique integer solution m other than 2 now this is a quadratic in m so i'm going to just sort it out first and the thing is that there is a unique integer with pm equals to p2 if this has an integer root let's call it let's say n now i know that the sum of roots by vietas is going to be negative a plus 2 which means that the other root is also integer So if that's the case, how can that still be a unique integer? I see a couple of ways, right? So either it is a repeated root, or if n is not the repeated root, then the thing here is 2. So if this is not 2, the other one... Um, could be 2. Now if the other root is 2, I can just substitute that into find. If n is a repeated root, I can use the discriminant to find. So I don't see that this is going to be conceptually very hard. I just need not to mess anything up. Uh, a, B, C are integers in here. It doesn't say they are distinct. And so therefore A and B can repeat. That is uh, not something I need to worry about. And for C, it will just be anything. Okay, so N is a repeated root. Let's uh, start with the case where 2 is a root of this quadratic. Now, 2 is a root of this quadratic. You end up with uh, 4A plus B plus 12 equals to 0. So B is a multiple of 4. It can go all the way to negative 20. And it can go all the way up to 20 where a will just go minus 2, minus 1, all the way up to... Hey, wait, no, no. a goes... If it's negative 20, it goes from 2, sorry. 2, 1, down to negative 8. So I see 11 possibilities here. And then I have also got n is a repeated root. So, uh, 
a squared plus 4a plus 4 minus 16 minus 8a minus 4b equals to 0. This gives me a squared minus 4a minus 12 equals to 4b. And so if a is even, then this would be a multiple of 12. I just need to make sure that it's not too big. So maybe I'll just complete the square so that it is more obvious um, how the range looks like. Okay, so here I get uh, a equals to 2, b is negative 4, 0 would give me negative 3, then negative 2 and 6 would give me 0. Then negative 4 and 8, that will give me 5 and 5. Negative 6 and 10, that will give me 12 and 12. I think we're hitting the limit here. Uh, if we go to negative 8 and 12, 10 squared, yeah, that's too big. So at this point, I now see that I've got 9 and 11. There are 20 possibilities. Now, I need to make sure that there is no overlap in here which makes me think well the easiest way to make sure there's no overlap would just have been to be a bit less lazy and just write everything out right so uh, i shall just write everything out and we can sort of stare yeah, that's the nice thing about the AIMB. we have time to just say you know what i'll just write them all down And I wrote all down and I forgot 12. So, um, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, minus 6, minus 7, minus 8. Now, what do we know? There is one duplicate here. And the rest of this is just an elaborate kind of uh, like searching game, right? Uh, Okay, so that seems to be the only thing that's repeated. So originally that would be 20. Now we're down to 19. Now, one of my final concerns is that, uh, what is this actually? Because if this is repeated, it means that 2 is a root and n is a repeated root and both of that happen doesn't it mean that the repeated root is 2 so let me just put in a is minus 6 and b equals to 12 and see what that gives me that gives me m squared minus 4m plus 4 equals to 0 and that means that 0 is the repeated root so in fact not only are they duplicated they are duplicates that I don't want so Go away. I, I don't just need to avoid overcounting it. I'm not supposed to over to count it at all. Now that was the only thing I was concerned about, right? So I was concerned about duplicates, but obviously um, when two is a root, the issue could be what if there is nothing but two? And if n is a repeated root, the concern could be what if two is the thing that's repeating? So both of those are resolved at the same time. And so you are left with 18 choices. 18 choices not being the end of the story, because there are a total of 41 choices for C. So multiplying this gives me 738, which well, thankfully is correct. Right? Nothing else should be missing or overcounted because, well, this is a quadratic, right? So quadratics usually give you the opportunity to consider cases again. Uh, as long as we are careful not to mess up and consider cases that we shouldn't or not consider cases that we should. Alright, so on to the last question in this section, which is a bit of a monster. Um, computationally, it's probably going to have to involve some mess. I'm not looking forward to this a lot because when typing this out, I realized that well, I mean, even if we have a shortcut, at some point I may still need to do like some big squares of 2023 20, or something like that. So, uh, but it doesn't seem like a lot of fun. 
Now, the question tells you there exists a unique positive integer a where this sum is an integer strictly between minus 1000 and 1000. For the unique a, find a plus u. Okay, so here's the intuition, right? If they tell me that the, there's a unique positive integer a, I can understand why. Because as a goes up, then this goes down. So the floor of it also goes down. And so it means u goes down. So as a is increasing, u will go down. And it will be making quite big jumps potentially. Right? The amount of change So if A goes up by 1, your U will approximately move by, well, it approximately moves by this, you're subtracting another N over 5. Now the float means that it's not exactly this, but it's roughly going to be this. And if it roughly does this, this is quite a lot. So another 5 and this is going to be about 2000 times 200. So if I'm not messing up, this is the change in U is approximately going to be negative 400,000. So it is not surprising that if we are doing this, it's quite impactful what value of A we choose. In fact, it's more surprising that there is something where it lands here. Imagine you're taking jumps of 400,000. The chance that you will jump over this interval from minus 1,000 to 1,000 is actually pretty high. So my suspicion is that the question setter would probably have tried a few different values before this thing worked and you have a small answer. I don't see why it is so guaranteed you will land there. Okay. Now... Uh, I am thinking about how to do an approximation and then just adjust from there. Now, because the gap is so big, it's around negative 400,000, I know that the rounding down, each time when you round down, you lose, I mean, it reduces it by between 0 and 1. In fact, it reduces it by between 0 and 4 fifths, but it's between this and this. This is quite a small range considering how big the jumps are. So since the jumps are so big and I'm saying that U is just in this narrow interval, I can just handle this thing here already and try to find out one where this is even vaguely in the vicinity of being near to zero. Not saying it can happen, but I just need it to be around there. Okay, so now that I want this to be around there, uh, I can even afford to take out the over 5. So I just need this to be around 0. Now please don't say something, oh, so A is equal to N. No, A cannot be equal to N, right? A is a constant, N is moving in the summation. So um, we need to be clear of which is our variable of summation and which is just a constant that we are trying to find. Okay, so this would equate to now the final computation is going to be a bit annoying, I think, but here this is not so bad. N n plus one, two n plus one. Uh, it's not so bad because we are doing approximations. Okay, so this will cancel. 
and I just get a is approximately going to be 4047 over 3 which is an integer 1349 great so this is again an approximation but since a is a positive integer so if you had something this turned out to be like a is approximately one three four nine and one third i would try one three four nine but if this is going to be one three four nine uh, then we try one three four nine okay so let's try that and to remind everybody of what the question was uh, here this summation was originally there was an over 5 and a flop so that's where now I have found A to a fairly high degree of certainty this becomes 1349A sorry 1349N pardon me flop over 5 means that I just need to consider when it's a multiple of 5 and if it's not, how much do I lose? So n squared minus 1349n is congruent to n squared plus n mod 5 and so I can just put this into a table uh, mod 5 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 this is 0, 2, 1, 2, 0 so each cluster I am actually going to just have this minus the fractional part and the fractional part is dependent on the thing mod 5 now I've already chosen this value such that without the flaw this is exactly equal to zero so this thing here is zero and the rest of it how much do i lose is the question i am going to lose in every cycle of five two fifths one fifth and two fifths in a cycle of 5 which means 1 so 2023 divided by 5 is 404 remainder 3 so you will lose 404 and the last cycle of 3 would be this 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 so you lose one more so actually this just means u is negative 405 oh, this wasn't so bad after all I thought this may be quite a mess um, I can see why uh, this would be considered a hard question because there are lots of ways in which you may create a mess but uh, you don't absolutely need to uh, make a mess and we are not making a mess so your answer is 1349 minus 405 equals to 944 good that looks like the correct answer and that's it for this video uh, question 6 to 10 it's not easy as you can see the video has taken um, approaching an hour but uh, this is how i would approach these questions in a competition environment as well so thanks for watching and see you very soon for the last five questions of uh, this aime one paper